Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be here as always. And um, if you'll start, um, if, you have a, if you have a Bible, we're going to be in the book of Daniel, chapter 3 today. So you can start turning to that, uh, the book of Daniel, chapter 3. And um, let me just say a quick prayer for us before we start, if you would um, pray with me. So Father, we thank you for this wonderful day that you've given us. I pray that um, the words I'm about to speak will be glorifying and honoring to you, and that, um, and that when we, upon hearing your words, Lord, we would be drawn closer to our walk with you. Thank you for this time. Thank you for the privilege of being able to gather as a family in this building, and may you speak to us now, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so the book of Daniel, lots of very fun, cool Sunday school stories uh, from the book of Daniel, you know, the lion's den, and we're going to be looking at one particular story today that is probably familiar to you if you grew up in Sunday school, if you have some kind of church background, you'll probably already know this story, but hopefully um, today we'll be able to get a little bit more out of it, and so, but let, let me catch you up first to where we are. So the book of Daniel takes place. Um, during a time where the Israelites, uh, once again, they find themselves under um, foreign oppression, under foreign rule. A very powerful kingdom, one of the most powerful kingdoms in the ancient world, has come in and they've taken over Israel. And this is the kingdom of Babylon, led by a king called Nebuchadnezzar at this point. So what the king Nebuchadnezzar did is that he comes into Israel, he overtakes um, the kingdom of Judah, and he, he, he kicks out the king. And then he sets up in, and then he overtakes the city of Jerusalem. And as a result of this, a lot of the Israelites who were living there at that time were exiled. Basically, they were kicked out of their country. They were exiled, and so it led to a lot of um, Jews at that time being spread all over the place. But the king was also quite smart. And he, you know, instead of just sending everybody away, he chose the best men of Israel, so the, the smartest, the most handsome, the most good-looking. You know, he, he took these men and he said, you know what, I can use these guys. These guys are smart. These guys are, you know, they were helpful for, these, for their kingdom, so they, could help for, they can be helpful for me also. And so what he did, he took the best of the best and he trained them up to work for him. He trained them up to work for him. And amongst these men, there were four that stood out above the rest if you remember the story, right? Uh, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azira, which they were given new names since now they have a new boss, a new employer. They, give, they were given new names, and these men were called Belteshah, which is, um, Belteshah, which is um, uh, Daniel's name, sorry, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those are the three guys we're going to be focusing most of our time on today. So these um, four young men, serving a foreign king, now managed to stand out above the rest. This king, you have to remember, he, he, was not an, he was not an Israelite. He did not worship Yahweh. He did not worship the same God that these four men worshipped. And yet, whilst working under this king, these four men were still able to keep their faith in the Lord. If you look in Daniel chapter 2, in fact, it says, you know, God works in a really powerful way in these young men's lives, right? Daniel chapter 2 is a very um, famous story about uh, the interpretation of King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. The story goes, King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and it's troubling for him, and he wants to find out what this dream means. And so he has a dream, and he gets up the next morning, and he calls in his wise men, and he says to his wise men, hey guys, I've had this dream, I want to figure out what it means. You guys are my wise men. Can you interpret my dream for me? And the wise men say, okay, king, tell us your dream and we'll interpret it for you. And the king says to them, you know what? Actually, if you guys, if you guys were really wise, if you really were wise men, you wouldn't need me to tell you what my dream was. You'd be able to figure it out yourselves and you'd be able to tell me an interpretation without me telling you anything. And so these wise men were like, king, Really? Nobody can do that. What you're asking for us to do is pretty much impossible. And so this, this gets the king angry. He's like, I thought you guys were supposed to be wise. I thought you guys were supposed to be helpful to me. 
and he gets angry and he says, you know what, since you guys are useless, you can't even do what I've asked you to do, I'm going to kill all the wise men in my whole kingdom. And now we have a problem because Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel, Balthazar, they are being trained up to be wise men. And so now their life is in danger. Their life is in danger. The king wants to kill them. The king said, I'm going to kill all wise men. This includes them. And so that night, Daniel and his friends, they go in and they pray. They pray and they ask God for guidance. They ask God to show them. They ask God to save them. And that evening, God comes through. He gives Daniel a vision. He lets Daniel know what the king's dream was. And he also lets Daniel know an, an interpretation of that dream. And so the next day, Daniel is able to stand before the king and say, King, you know what? God has spoken to me. The God in heaven the Almighty God has spoken to me, and He's let me know your dream, and He's let me know the interpret. He's also let me know what this dream means. He's allowed me to interpret your dream for you. And as Daniel is talking to the king, the king finds out what this guy's saying, what Daniel's saying, is actually true. It's exactly as he had dreamed. And so the king says, "You know what? You guys are really wise. There is only one person that could have done this, and this is a powerful God that could have done this." And so as a result, Daniel and his friends are promoted. They're promoted and they, they do well and they're, they're sent out to serve in different parts of the kingdom. Now, if the story ended there, it would be great. If the story ended there, then we could say something like, well, if you put your faith in God, then everything in your life is going to turn out fine. You're going to get that promotion. You're going to succeed in life. Everything will be fine. But that's not where the story ends. And as we turn to the next chapter, we find that this is not the case at all. So in chapter 3, if you read in verses 1 to 7, I'm not going to read it all for the sake of time, but we see that King Nebuchadnezzar, despite the fact that he's just seen God work in a very powerful way in his life, his heart still isn't right. And we know his heart still isn't right because he goes on to build a huge golden image. It says, it calls, it says a huge golden image, which was really, really tall, really, really big. If it was built today, it'd probably be about nine stories tall. That's how big it was. Why would he do this? It's because he still doesn't understand who God is. Actually, in fact, the reason why he might have been tempted or built, I mean, he actually built this thing in the first place was because of Daniel's interpretation of his dream. You see, when Daniel told the king about his dream, he said, um, in the dream, you had an image of a, of a tall statue, and this statue had a face of gold, a head of gold, and that is you, king. That is you. And so now King Nebuchadnezzar probably feels kind of prideful. Yeah, I'm a gold head. That's pretty cool. You know, I'm, I'm a big statue. I'm a powerful guy. And so now he's full of pride. And so he, what he tries to do is recreate this image in real life. Now, what this image exactly was, the Bible doesn't really tell us. Um, some people say it was an image of one of the many gods that the Babylonians served. So it could have been a false god. Maybe it was an image of the king himself. Maybe it was you know, a recreation of his face or his body or something. We don't exactly know what it is. But the main point was, is that it was an idol. And it was an idol, which means it was something that was not glorifying to God. And it went directly in the face of God's first commandments, which says, you shall have no other gods before me. And as I, as I was reading that, it made me think to myself, what kind of idols do I have in my own life? What kind of things have I set in front of God in my own life? And as we read through the story, we're going to realize that, you know what, we have to be very careful which, with what we hold as important in our lives because those things can become idols. And this story is going to show us that idols have no place in the life of a believer. And there is only one God. So the real trouble comes now. Not only does a king put up this image, it's an idol, so now he's saying, everybody, when I call upon you, you have to worship this image. You have to fall down, bow down, and serve and worship this image. 
and he has like a celebration party. So he calls all his government officials, he calls all his workers, and he says, everybody gather. And as you gather at this image, when you hear the music being played, everybody has to bow down and worship it. And the punishment is, if you refuse to do so, the punishment would be by death through being thrown into a fiery furnace. See, what the writer of this story is trying to do here is, is he's, he's trying to set up tension. Because we know these three men, Daniel and his friends, okay, are worshippers of God. We know that they have great faith in God. And so now comes a challenge to their faith. How are they going to act? Will they run away and hide? Are they going to compromise their faith? And are they going to bow down to this idol? Maybe this is a good reminder for us too. Because we never know, at any given moment, our faith might be challenged. It could be at your workplace, it could be maybe even in your family, it could be as you're walking down the street. We don't know. At any given time, your faith might be challenged. And how are we going to react when that moment comes along? We find here, Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, they do the right thing. But yet, it ends them up in even more trouble. They refuse to bow down to this image. And some people see that they've done that. And what they do, they go behind their backs and they tell the king, you know what, king? These, there's these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They don't worship. They're not doing what you told them. And didn't you say, O oh, king, that if nobody worships, if, if anyone who doesn't worship this God that you've set up is going to be thrown in the fiery furnace? What these men are doing is that they're jealous. They're jealous because these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, have been promoted to high places despite being foreigners, people who are not Babylonians in the first place. They're being promoted and maybe perhaps they felt jealous and so they were out to get them. They were maliciously trying to get them into trouble. And that's the, the plain and simple truth for us is as followers of Christ sometimes, Following God might indeed lead us into more trouble, into people attacking us, people persecuting us, people even ridiculing you. You know, Jesus warns us of this himself. In John, chapter, um, in John 15, verse 18, it says, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. So we need to be able to make a decision before that moment comes, how are we going to act? Are we going to be double-minded and waver and change between situations when people start to challenge us? Or are we going to stand firm? Now here comes the moment of truth. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are summoned before the king. And the king is angry because these men aren't doing what he told them to do. He's really angry and he says to them, he challenges them one more time. It's like he's given them a final chance. He says, is it true? Is it true that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I've set up? And then he moves on to threaten their lives. He says, Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image I've made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will be able to deliver you out of my hands? These three friends have a choice to make. They can compromise or they can stand firm. Now you might think, of well, putting your life on the line, that's a little bit too extreme, isn't it? Surely God doesn't want them to do that. They could have maybe discussed and, and rationalized the situation. You know, if, if we don't obey God in this case, he's going to understand, right? It's okay if we disobey. I mean, dying in a fiery furnace, that's a, think about that. That's such a horrible way to go. Surely God doesn't want us to suffer that way. That's terrible. Or they could have said, you know what? Let's talk about this, guys. What good are we to God if we're dead? If we're dead, we can't serve God anymore. If we're, best thing to do would just be do, just, let's just do what the king's telling us to do 
and so we can go on and live and we can use the rest of our lives to serve God. That makes more sense, doesn't it? Or they could have said, you know what? It's okay. Let's just go through the actions. You know, we're just doing it in our hearts. We're not really doing it. It's just our actions, outwardly appearance that's doing it, and then that'll be fine. And then we'll, we'll preserve our lives, and then we'll go on living. That we, we'll, we'll be saved that way. Or they could have said, God is forgiving. We know God is forgiving, so it's okay. Let's just do this and ask God for forgiveness later. That's going to be fine. God understands. And they could have come up with a whole amount of excuses to try and justify disobeying the commandment of God. And as I read this, I thought to myself, you know, how many times have I done this in my own life? And how many times am I still tempted to do this in my own life? We know what we're supposed to do. We know what God is calling us to do, and yet we try with a whole bunch of excuses not to do it. Oh, that's too much money. That, 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 that's not for me. Oh, I go over there? No. Talk to that person? That's going to be embarrassing. Really? You don't want me to do that, God. I'll just serve you in some other way instead. And we try and convince ourselves that God is okay with us not following His will completely. But it's not okay. What God wants for the life of His followers is for us to follow His will. And it's true, of course it's true, that when we disobey, when we fall short, there is grace and forgiveness for us. I know this because the scripture, Bible tells me that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. But when we sin, and when we sin and we base that upon God's grace, then really we haven't understood the true meaning of grace and forgiveness at all. And I would say that if we keep on making a habit of doing this over and over and over again, maybe we're not even Christians in the first place. The whole point of Jesus dying on the cross for us was so that we too can die for our sins. In Romans 6, it says this, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who have died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We are buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Brothers and sisters, the encouragement today is this. We have to stand firm in our faith. Compromising our faith is going to lead us to slide down a very, very slippery slope and end us in a way far, far away from God. And that's not where we want to be. There's something else I want to point out here too. You see, most of the time when we compromise our faith, when we want to take things into our own hands, it's because we think we are more powerful than God. We think we know better than God. That's the mentality, right? God, you know, This isn't what's best for me. This is what's best for me, so I'm going to do this instead. And when we look at Nebuchadnezzar's response, this is exactly what he's thinking. He thinks he's the one in charge. He thinks he's God. If we listen again, Nebuchadnezzar is kind of, he's taunting them at the end. He says to them, Who is the God who is able to deliver you out of my hands? Who is the God who is able to deliver you out of my hands? Nebuchadnezzar is making a direct challenge to God. You know, there's always going to be times, maybe we know people who always think they're more important than they really are. One of my friends, he loved to used to do this. Um, he, his, his most famous catchphrase was he would say, do you know who my father is? And um, his dad was some kind of diplomat or something. I never really knew what his dad did. I never did find out. I, don't, I, don't, I still don't know who his dad is. But um, he used to say that when he would get in trouble. And so, you know, when, when, um, when this one particular time, the most memorable time he said this was, we were at a restaurant eating dinner, and um, he ordered something, and he couldn't get what he wanted. And so he said to the waiter, do you know who my father is? He is the manager of this restaurant, and he'll have you fired in a second if you don't give me what I want. Well, the trouble was, the young man he was speaking to was actually the manager's son. <laughs> and so ended up making himself look like a fool and embarrassing the whole table, and it was terrible. Maybe you can relate to a situation like that, too. 
a lot of the times, we think we're in control. We think we're big time. We think, yeah, you know, I know what's going on. And this is what Nebuchadnezzar thinks. He thinks he's in control. I'm the king, right? I can do whatever I want. He thinks he's the one holding the fate of these men in their hands. But what he's soon to find out, and what we're all going to find out, is that God is the one who is truly in control. He is the true king, and not Nebuchadnezzar. And so notice, the beautiful response, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say this at this challenge. They say, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, which means if you're really going to kill us by throwing us in the fiery furnace, if this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. These three men have no need to defend themselves in front of the king. They don't need to justify their actions. They're not thinking this way or that way. They're not trying to come up with different excuses. They have already made up their minds. And there's nothing the king or anyone can do to change it. And so the first part of the response, it sounds really good. Let's read it again. It says, If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand. One more thing I want to encourage you with you today is this. If you came into this room today facing trials and troubles and tribulations of some kind, carrying some kind of burden, some kind of hopelessness in your heart, something or someone oppressing you, someone limiting your freedom, something, some kind of darkness, some kind of hopeless situation. If that's the way you came into this room today, I want to tell you that God is able to rescue you from that. As we read through the Bible, it's full of scriptures that reassure us that God is able. He is in control. He is the true king. If we go back all the way to the book of Genesis, we see that what? God is able to create this world, this whole universe, out of nothing. God created it. In Exodus, we see God is able to lead the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt through a set of phenomenal supernatural events. He leads the Israelites out of oppression into the promised land. God is able to do that. In the book of Joshua, God is able to use a bunch of people just to walk around some walls a few times. And then the walls come tumbling down and the Israelites defeat the enemy of Jericho. God is able to lead his army. In 1 Samuel, God uses a little shepherd boy called David. And he is able to defeat the giant that is Goliath. In the book of Psalms, we read exaltations that speak of God's ability to be our stronghold, our refuge, our everlasting hope, the God who is with us no matter where we are. In the book of Isaiah, we see God is the one who is able to cast judgment. The whole world is filled with His glory, Isaiah tells us. And in Ezekiel, we see God is a God of restoration. And even in a valley of dry bones, God is able to revive these bones so that they become flesh again. And when we get to the New Testament, we see Jesus come down. And he lives his life on this earth. Jesus, as God, is able to heal diseases, to heal sicknesses, to cast out evil spirits. Even the wind and the waves, he is able to control and contain. And we read that God is able, Jesus was able to die for our sins. But despite of death, he was able to raise three days later, conquering sin and death once and for all. Brothers and sisters, our God is indeed able. But there's a second part of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's response. One that makes me, as I was reading this, a bit more uncomfortable. It says this. They say this. But if not. Our God is able. But if not. Now hold on a second. Why are they doubting? Aren't, aren't, aren't we supposed to be full of faith? You almost want to say to them, well, if that's the attitude, boys, then of course God's not going to save you. If not, why are you doubting? Why are you, even, why are you even saying those things? And indeed, 
things take a bad turn for these three men at this point. Upon hearing the response, Nebuchadnezzar is now really angry. It says he is furious. He orders the furnace to be turned all the way up. That's what it means when it says heat it up seven times hotter than it usually is. The king wants to make sure, in other words, that the furnace is as, is, it's as hot as it can possibly get to ensure that these three men had no chance of escape. Death by the fiery furnace, in, in fact, might have been a final insult to these men because it's quite possible that this was a furnace, the furnace that the king was using to melt the metals, to do, you know, do all the craft work that needed to build the image in the first place. And the fact, the, the story tells us that these three men had their clothes left on. The normal practice was to take off the clothes, to strip someone naked before throwing them into the flames. This highlights the king's anger. He didn't want to wait. No time even to strip these guys naked and take all their clothes off. Just throw them in the way they are. He was really angry. He wants these men dead right now, right away. And so it seems like these three guys are in a really hopeless situation right now. The furnace is heated to the maximum temperature. And the story tells us that the king ordered the strongest men, these strong men, to guide them up to the furnace. And not only did, does it say that he used his strongest men, if we read between the verses of 19 and 23 in Daniel chapter 3, between 19 and 23, excuse me, three times, three different times it mentions that these men were bound. These men were bound. These men were bound. So the writer is really trying to highlight the hopelessness of the situation. There is no hope for these guys. And then it happens. They fall into the furnace. And again, we might think, well, of course they did. They didn't have enough faith. They fell in. God didn't save them because they doubted. They doubted the fact that God would save them. But if not, they said. When I was reading this, it really challenged me in checking my attitude towards faith. You know, sometimes when we pray and we ask God and He doesn't do what we ask Him to do, we, we sometimes we're tempted to think, oh, it's it's because I didn't have enough faith, right, Lord? It's because I didn't have enough faith. And so what happens when we do that? We try and muster up faith. We try and do all these things, you know, and we, we try and muster up and demonstrate to God, yes, I have faith, Lord, I have faith, I have faith. Please do what I want you to do. The question is this. Does more faith always equal answered prayer? When we do this, when we think about faith this way, and we are, when we approach God this way, I don't think it's really faith. It's just our own human desires parading as God's faith. Because true faith should never be based on the outcome of what happens. Faith is not desire plus optimism equals faith. That's not what faith is. But rather, faith is knowing that no matter what the outcome is, we're going to trust in God anyway. Faith does not claim to know what only God can know, but faith is the claim that I know the God who does know. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yes, we should pray. We should ask God to save us. But even when God doesn't match us up with our expectations, faith is being able to say, thy will be done and not mine. A lot of the times when we, as Christians, we are tempted to say, as long as we have enough faith, then God promises us health, wealth, happiness, all the rest of our days. We never have to suffer. That's a lie. Don't believe in that lie. And don't ever believe anyone who would tell you such a message. I have no doubt these three men were men of great faith. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in the, early in this story, in, this, in the book of Daniel, they've already demonstrated their faith. Yet they still had to fall into the fiery furnace. In fact, when it comes to faith, if faith could save us for anything, then how come Jesus didn't live a perfect life? He had perfect faith in God, and yet he still had to go through everything he went through and die a horrific death. Faith does not guarantee us the blessings of God all the time, but what it does give us is God himself. And if we're truly followers of God, 
that should be enough for us. Our biggest and deepest desire is to have God, not simply what God can give us. And so remember what happens now. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're in the fiery furnace. And the king's standing back. He doesn't want to get too close because he's, some of his best men have already been killed. This furnace is so hot that it's killed some of his best men just leading these three guys up to the furnace. And he's standing at a distance and he's watching. And he's expecting to see these guys just being consumed by the fire. But what he sees, he doesn't believe his eyes in the first place. It's too, he can't believe it. First thing he notices is that instead of three people, there are now four people in the furnace. And not only were there four people, but do you remember just now when the story said they were bound three times? They were bound, they were bound, they were bound. Now they're suddenly, they're unbound. They're no longer tied up. And the story seems to make it um, seem like they're walking around as if they're having a good time and they're enjoying themselves. And this fourth person, is, he's very mysterious. He can't be described, but the, all the, the best that the king can do, he says that his appearance is like a son of the gods. Who is this fourth person? You know, in some of the research I was doing, it was saying that this fourth person was um, Jesus, pre-incarnate, appearing in the Old Testament. Some people say, you know, it was like in the lion's den. It was, uh, you know, it was an angel protecting Daniel. I'm not too sure the specifics really matter. The Bible doesn't tell us clearly who this fourth person was, but the representation of this person is the presence of God in the situation that these men were facing. You see, our God is able to save us, but we have to let God do it His way. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they emerge from the furnace, totally untouched by the fire, you see, God's protection is so bountiful over them. It's so perfect over them. It's not like they came out with second-degree burns all over their body, but still alive. They didn't have to run out of the fire, stop, drop, and roll, and get rid of all the flames. Okay? It says that even their clothes didn't smell. Can you believe that? I mean, have you ever been to, uh, outside to do some barbecue? You know, you're barbecuing, you're cooking food, and when you get home and smell your clothes, it stinks, doesn't it? It smells of smoke. Everything stinks. These guys, it tells us that even their clothes weren't smelling. You see how perfect the protection of God was over them? The point is this. Often, we want, to, we want God to save us from the fiery things of life. We want God to save us from the trials of life. But often, God does His best work when we're in the fire and trials of life. God's promise is not that he's going to remove you from everything bad that happens to you, but his promise is that he is with you in everything that happens to you. So like I said just now, I don't know. We all came in here with different burdens and, and senses of hopelessness, and I'm talking about myself here too. You know, I needed to hear this message just as much as everyone else in this room needs to hear it today. I'm not sure what we're facing but what I do know is this. If we walk with God, if we allow Him to have total control of our lives, if we make Him the King over everything in us, and he is, then He is with us and He is able to carry us through. One of the most ironic things about this story is that King Nebuchadnezzar thought he was in control of the whole situation. But what he finds out in the end that, no, He's not the king. In this world, in this universe, there is only one true king, and that is our God in heaven. Life is going to get crazy, guys. But we have to decide for ourselves. Are we going to put our faith in him and let God guide us? Because when we do that, no matter what comes our way, we know that God is always by our side. Pray with me, please. Father, we're all facing different things in this room. Maybe even some many unforeseen things in the future that we're going to come across. Lord, when these things come up, I pray that we would just 
give it all over to you and trust that because you are sovereign, because you are king, you know best. And that whilst, Lord, we want to pray to you to help us through these situations, help us to also be able to accept no, no matter what comes our way, if we've put our life into your hands, the way you lead is the way that we should be going. Help us not to be tempted to go to the right or to the left and take matters into our own hands, but recognize you as king over our lives so that we may serve you and bring glory to you in everything that we do. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.